Welcome to Kaiser Health News. I'm Mary Agnes Carey. By a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court today upheld the health loss subsidies that help millions of Americans purchase health insurance. With me now to discuss the decision is legal analyst Stuart Taylor of the Brookings Institution and Kaiser Health News senior correspondent Julie Appleby. Thanks to both of you for being here. Nice to be with you. Be here. Stuart, I want to start with you. I want to talk about uh, Justice Roberts wrote for the majority. Why did he uphold the administration on this subsidy issue? Well, the Chief Justice began by acknowledging that a few poorly drafted words in this 2,700-word page law, if they were interpreted literally, would cripple uh, the Affordable Care Act in 34 states for complicated reasons. So he said, but we don't have to interpret these words literally. We shouldn't interpret them literally because when you read them in the structure of lots of other interlocking provisions of this statute, uh, in that context and in the overall structure, uh, it, you know, they become ambiguous. And then you look to, well, what was Congress trying to accomplish here? They were trying to improve health insurance markets all over the country. We shouldn't interpret this law unless we really have to in terms of the language as uh, having it destroy health insurance markets, because he explained that it would destroy health insurance markets if the Obama interpretation were rejected. First, it would mean there would be no premium subsidies for millions and millions of people in those 34 states. Then many of them wouldn't be able to fight for the insurance. They wouldn't buy the insurance. Others would no longer have to buy the insurance for complicated reasons. Uh, and there would be what he called a death spiral with premiums soaring because only six people are getting insured. He says, Congress certainly didn't mean that to happen. And that heavily influenced his interpretation. And Justice Scalia wrote the dissent. He was equally as spirited in a completely different reading. Yes, I'm just looking at some of his adjectives. He's always fun for adjectives. Absurd, feeble, indefensible, and my favorite was a noun, interpretive jiggery-pokery. Yeah, I like that one. Those were the ways he characterized the Roberts opinion, and he went on in his usual eloquent, uh, hyperbolic, uh, dyspeptic way for 21 pages to trash the majority opinion, and Roberts responded, as is customary in majority opinions, you know, in a much more measured fashion. He had a few little footnotes saying, well, Justice Scalia says X, or the defense says Y, but we disagree, and here's why. So in the dissent, the words established by the state were interpreted much more literally as an exchange established by the state. That's how I read Exactly. That as well. and, and that's what uh, was forecast. And, uh, that's the whole argument in the case. Does the fact that they said subsidies are available in uh, exchanges, marketplaces established by the state, as opposed to those established by the federal government, uh, are, are people in those uh, ineligible unless they're established by the state? Does that mean you can't get a subsidy? And the dissent basically said, that's what it's, it means what it says, it, what says it says what it means. And the majority said, eh, not so fast. Sometimes things don't say exactly what they seem to say when you read them in their larger context. Now, going back to the majority opinion for a minute, is it written in a way that a future Internal Revenue Service couldn't come in and then say subsidies aren't available in the federally run exchanges? No, Chief Justice Roberts ruled that out, basically. The question was debated at oral argument. In fact, Roberts asked, you know, well, if we're deferring to the interpretation of the IRS, does that mean a new IRS could come along and say we're changing it? And he mooted that question in the decision by saying we're not deferring to the interpretation of the IRS. We're agreeing with the interpretation of the IRS, but it's our interpretation and the IRS can't change it. And Julie, let's talk a little bit about the administration, the Democrats. They must be just elated over this. What's been the reaction? Well, you know, a little while ago, the president came out of the White House and gave a short speech. And basically, he said that after more than 50 attempts to repeal this, after a presidential election, after a couple of Supreme Court challenges, he said the ACA is here to stay. So he made that very clear. The ACA is here to stay. He went on to say that the Supreme Court upheld a very critical part of this law, the subsidies that more than 6.8 million people are currently receiving. But I think in a nod to some of the discussion about repeal, he also mentioned sort of the broader context here, that this law affects a lot of Americans. Uh, and he mentioned a few things. He mentioned being able to keep your kids on the plan until age 26. And he mentioned the fact that insurers can no longer reject people who have uh, medical conditions. So he tried to show that this is a, a broad-reaching law. Um, 
he did come out and say that he wants to work with the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, he acknowledged that there's more that needs to be done, and he said he would work with them. And he, he called out some of the states that haven't yet expanded Medicaid. There's about 20 states who haven't expanded eligibility for the Medicaid program, and he said he would be working with the governors and the legislatures there to try to encourage them to do that. How about Republicans? What have they been saying today? You know, the Republicans in their official statements are coming out and saying that um, that they're not happy with this decision. But I do think that many of them are breathing a sigh of relief because if the subsidies had gone away, they would be in a position when then when lots of Americans would be losing these tax credits to help them purchase insurance. And they had not coalesced around a plan to, to um, fix that or to, to deal with that. So I think in many cases they are a little relieved. But at the same time, they are continuing to talk about how this is um, not a good law and that it's fundamentally broken. And so it sounds like their efforts to repeal will continue. How does this shape the 2016 presidential election, this decision today? What's going to be the impact? Yeah, that's going to be very interesting. I think that Hillary Clinton will certainly make it a big part of her campaign to keep this law in place and say that the Democrats would support that. I think the Republicans are in a little bit more of a difficult situation because repealing is going to be meaning that you might be taking some things away from millions of Americans who already have it. So that's a little bit more difficult of a message, but that one will probably still be out there. So I think this will be a discussion in the election, but I think there's other issues that may be a larger, like the economy. Sure. And Stuart, can you take us through, are there other pending legal challenges to the Affordable Care Act? There's at least two, but only one of them, I think, uh, is, uh, is very serious in terms of any possibility of having much impact on the act, and that's a lawsuit brought by the House of Representatives as a body, which is highly unusual in the first question, against the administration. The first question is, well, do they have legal standing because the House of Representatives bring a lawsuit, which is an open question. But the claim they're making is not silly. The claim they're making is that hundreds of millions of, hundreds of billions of these subsidies over the next 10 years uh, were not appropriated by Congress that the administration asked Congress to appropriate this money on a year-by-year -year basis, uh, and Congress refused. And the Constitution says uh, money can't be spent by the government unless it's appropriated by Congress. So that gives the administration a problem. The lawsuit's being taken seriously by Federal District Judge Rosemary Collier, uh, who sits here in the District of Columbia. But it's got a long way to go, and even if it's successful, which I would bet against, uh, it's not going to cripple the Obamacare law the way uh, a, a decision going against the president today would have crippled it. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Stuart Taylor and Julie Appleby. Thank you. Thank you.